Greetings, podcast powerhouses. Welcome to the Marvelous TV Club, a podcast tackling our collective obsession with the latest releases from the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And right now, that means getting amped for Falcon and the Winter Soldier, which debuts in less than 48 hours. Every week, we analyze the newest chapter of the MCU from multiple angles you will only find on this podcast. Our StoryCast preview of Falcon and the Winter Soldier unpacks over 80 years of Captain America's symbolic impact on our culture. Our character cast preview reconnects us with the main characters of our show, their strengths, weaknesses, best scenes, and more. And this is PonderVision. Today, we're going to preview Falcon and the Winter Soldier by asking all the deep questions lurking in our subconscious. We will bring them forth and interrogate them like Zemo on a Hydra agent. Wait, no, that's a terrible analogy. <laughs> but we're going to get way into the Sokovia Accords. What constitutes a truly equitable version of Marvel Studios, whether it's wise to reveal your secret identity, and more. I am your host, Mark Folletti, and as always, I am joined by Damage Control's General Counsel, Jesse Taylor. Hey, Jesse. Hello. How's it going tonight? All right, man. I'm, I'm officially in hype mode. Where are you, scale of 1 to 10, or even maybe other Marvel movie before it came out? What's your interest level comparison for Falcon and the Winter Soldier? Right now, my comparison level is, I'd say Captain Marvel, which okay. I was really excited for. Um, didn't quite live up to my expectations, <laughs> right. uh, but I was really excited for it for a variety of reasons, and a lot of those reasons transfer to Falcon and Winter Soldier. Fair enough. Yeah, I, I, think, I think I'm somewhere in the Civil War region, which was to say, I was trying not to get too excited. I was a little wary of them tackling complex subject matter, which I think they're doing here. But we'll see. Hopefully, there's nothing as awkward as Sharon and Steve's kiss in this show. Christina and I talk a lot about that on Character Cast. I had way more opinions than even I realized about it, and I thought I had a lot of opinions. So, Episode 5 is just Falcon and Red Wing finally consummating that relationship. <laughs> My God. You know, it's cool to like a drone. I, I told Christine, I'm really anti-drone in the Marvel Universe. Where are you? Do you like seeing like Spider-Man have his little chest drone and whatnot? I don't like it. Um, and part of it is the appeal of a lot of these superheroes is that they're themselves. And Spider-Man in particular, you know, Spider-Man struggles. That's the entire point. That's what we saw in Civil War. That's what we've seen with Spider-Man all along. He's kind of a like lower middle class to, you know, maybe even poor kid in Queens who was dumpster diving just to have a functioning right. computer, but also has a chest drone and a suit that can survive the rigors of outer space. Yeah, I just think drones are like cheating and I can't really put my finger on it and it probably dates me. So do let me know in an Apple five star review if that's the case. So, well, let me actually tell you one other issue that I have with drones. Okay, please do. So, uh, I am assuming that you, uh, being a childless man who, uh, you know, watches age appropriate television, that you haven't seen a lot of Paw Patrol. I have not. Uh, although, whether a lot of MCU content is age appropriate is probably an open question, but I, I think that's it is. true. But anyway, um, no, Paw Patrol, not on the radar. Okay. So, uh, do you know the premise of Paw Patrol? I assume it's dog police. <laughs> oh, man. So, uh, it's it's actually really weird once you break it down and look weird even for <laughs> a kid's show. children's shows are hellscapes if you look too closely, Jesse. Yeah. The pro you don't have to look closely at Paw Patrol. <laughs> oh, no. So, Is there Mephisto? Wait, no, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> so, um, the Paw Patrol are a group of six like sentient talking dogs <laughs> who are all tasked with like specialty skills by about a 10 or 11 year old boy named Ryder. Okay. And they live in adventure Bay, which is run by mayor Goodway, uh, an incompetent, corrupt official who leaves all public safety measures to the Paw Patrol. Oh dear. And then Ryder has assigned all of the dogs identities you find this out pretty early on but Ryder is the one who like, makes chase the police dog and marshall the fire dog sky the flying dog and you go down the list and there's all these paw patrol identities and then Ryder tasks them with handling various events in town so anyway about the second season or so chase the police dog whose main like 
claim to fame slash skill set was having traffic cones and a winch. Okay. Got a drone. <laughs> and then every episode was just Chase running a surveillance state oh, to gosh. figure out like where Farmer Yumi's carrots went. Oh, no. And to the extent that the show could be ruined, that absolutely ruined it for me. <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> Yeah, that's a good reason to be opposed to drones is if they're being used in children's shows to <laughs> acclimate them to the surveillance state. That right. seems like a, like a real bummer. One day a friendly German shepherd is going to be spying on you for your own good. Oh, man. Yeah. Yeah, and don't be alarmed by weird flying objects controlled by figures of authority. It's all for your best interests, I guess. Right. Oh, dear. Well, that's an example of what we we get into here on ponder vision we're going to break down our three kind of usual segments so i'm going to call the first one something different we normally call it still chewing because we're chewing on these things from an episode we do not have an episode yet so what we have this time are appetizers we're then of course going to go meta and talk about the making of these programs and marvel mcu content in general and of course life in the mcu we're going to place ourselves inside this universe to talk about the things that are on our mind about what that would be like Jesse, let's start with our appetizers. What's on your mind, buddy? So this is just a minor thing from having watched some Falcon and Winter Soldier teasers and the trailer and all of that. Thinking about sort of the level of power in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. We've talked before about who the most powerful Avenger is and how it's sort of been, you know, escalated from Hulk to Thor, Captain Marvel, very obviously Scarlet Witch now. But we don't really talk about the other end of things where you've got Captain America, who I would say, based on what we've seen in the movies, has legitimate superpowers, like even absent technology, absent his shield. He's superhumanly strong, fast, et cetera. If you can grab a helicopter and keep it from flying away. Yeah, I can. But keep in mind, bicep curl a helicopter. Oh, man. Yeah. What a flex. And then you've got Winter Soldier, who is, you know, at least he has a metal arm. Uh, gifts. There's some elements of super strength, et cetera, there from the experiments that have been performed on him. Even Falcon, even though it's techno technology, he can still fly. He has a, this drone that he can do various things with, depending on the situation. Um, he has weapons, et cetera. Then you think about Hawkeye. And I wonder how he's perceived in that universe. Black Widow is obviously an operative who has fallen in with the Avengers. Right. But if you think about the power level of somebody like a Hawkeye or a Black Widow who are just very, very good at fighting and maybe a couple of specific types of weapons, are they actually considered superheroes? What is the definition of a superhero in the MCU? I would argue that Hawkeye might get the nod even over Black Widow unless she can also do something like play 18 holes of golf and shoot 18 on those holes of golf. That's the one moment where I was like, I guess Hawkeye kind of has a superpower because nobody should be able to have that level of accuracy and it, it's not technology assisted, which presumably he's not out there with a shield labeled golf club, you know, <laughs> that does some <laughs> kind of magic shit, has a drone carrying the ball over and dropping it in the hole. But I think he's borderline because that level of aim, you can do a lot with that. They actually kind of underutilize him in regards to that. I feel like there's a chance in his MCU show to show him being more creative about anything from like firing an arrow that like does a specific thing to a lock to, to you know, throwing objects that are around you. Again, like maybe he takes like a paper clip and does something wild with it by threading the needle. And, you know, there's underutilized abilities of his. And, you know, I fucking hate Hawkeye. So right. I don't say this lightly, but I think he might be a superhero. What do you think? I go back and forth on it. I was thinking about the 18 holes, 18 holes in one. Was line he bullshitting he even? I mean, it's unclear. That's the thing. It's Clint Barton. And more specifically, <laughs> it's Jeremy Renner. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? But taking that at face value, I could see it. It's also sort of insinuated in the original Avengers. He has to sit far away because his eyesight is so good that he can kind of see everything and he needs to be that far away to kind of take in everything that he can perceive. So maybe there's something there. If only he had seen Loki coming, eh? Right. But, you know, from the outsider's perspective, the power set that various heroes have is probably, I would think, 
distilled in the public. Like there's probably obsessives who are thinking about every second, what exactly can Steve Rogers do? How much can he sure. bench press? How fast can he run? But I got to think, you know, like the average kid on the street who goes up to Hulk in a diner and wants his autograph or things like that, they're just like, okay, well, you know, Thor's got a magic hammer and he lives in an alternate universe or dimension or whatever. Iron Man has this fantastic suit of armor. And Hawkeye, I mean, I could see people even being confused about, is he a good archer or does he have a special bow and mm -hmm. arrows that make him a good archer? I would guess he's the most heavily memed Avenger yeah. that people are using him like they use Drake in our world, maybe. In fact, there's actually a lot of interesting comparisons mm -hmm. there where they're, they're kind of workmanlike and effective and undeniably successful. Mm -hmm. But does anybody really like them? Is anybody really a fan? Do you, is, or is it just more fun to bag on them and kind of generally trash on them? In the same way that Drake is kind of this try-hard Toronto Raptors fan, maybe right, Hawkeye's like, out here just being a little try-hard Avengers guy? Like, is he perceived as the person who shows up at Avengers fights and cheers them on like Drake does? Right. Is he the hype man? Basically. Yeah, and he finally gets rewarded in 2019 when the Avengers win something. Yeah. But then if the Avengers ever lose, it's just like, oh, that's Hawkeye being Hawkeye again. Yeah. No, I think that's a really fair question. I do think he's the least popular Avenger, and I don't think it's close. Yeah. And hopefully they play with that again. I hope this very question comes up in his MCU show because they're finally going to use the Matt, Matt Fraction comics, which for folks who don't know is about a Hawkeye who's down on his luck and not in a great place. I don't know how they're going to handle that with his family, which does not exist in the comics, but I, I have a suspicion he's been kicked out of the house. They play a lot with this in the comics with the idea that there are different tiers of Avengers. Mm -hmm. And so when the <laughs> Avengers show up, you have you know your Thors and your Captain Americas and your Scarlet Witches who are just your A tier. Everybody knows them. That is impressive to have them show up. Then you've got your your Jack of Hearts, your Justices, uh, your guys who show up. And it's like, if, you, if they didn't have another Avenger alongside them, it's like trying to get into a club. Yeah. If they don't have somebody to vouch for them, nobody's going to believe they're actually Avengers. And where does Hawkeye fall on that scale? Poor Hawkeye. I won't miss him in this show we're gonna find out yeah sharon carter is gonna have 95 percent of his abilities maybe again mm -hmm. doesn't have the eagle eye but she's out there kicking ass and at a certain point you know what's the difference right the thing i want to talk about jesse and i really really want to talk about it mm -hmm. because it should matter in this show is the sokovia accords i begin with a simple value question for you are you pro registration as a concept yes Tell me more. The reason for that being that even though we're talking about people, we're also talking about people who have innate abilities that go far beyond things that we also should register in real life. You know, your average Avenger is far deadlier than an AR-15 or a car bomb or anything that you would hope we're keeping track of. Um, and restricting the use of in the real world when it comes to real threats. And, you know, you think about the Avengers and heroes that we're looking forward to in the next several years. So you've got your cosmic level folks like the Eternals, people who might have some affiliation with the Avengers. You've also got your Earth level superheroes between the mutants and Fantastic Four, uh, Miss Marvel even Moon Knight, She-Hulk, etc. These are all people who, if they get angry, if they go wrong, if they make a mistake, you're talking about an entire neighborhood is at risk. Yeah, Not just one person, not just a bad guy, but a lot of people, a lot of innocent bystanders. And so I see the value of that registration. And the issue, of course, is in the execution. Because the Sokovia Accords seem to go a step further, and it's also because we have the smaller universe of heroes. We don't have the full Marvel complement of 7,000 different heroes running around, any of whom could show up to a bank robbery. We've got a set handful of people on Earth fighting crime slash supervillainy at any given time. And in terms of those people, there's this idea that they can be sort of utilized and directed by 
either their own government or by governments around the world as agreed upon and as dictated. But if you are the, you know, say you're in a Spider-Man position where you randomly discover you have powers one day, do you register if that means that you turn into a government agent and could potentially be called upon to do things you never wanted to do and never intended to do by hap- and the only reason you have the ability to do those things is happenstance. So you're saying basically there's two kinds of registration. The first would be, hey, I exist. You should know about me as a potential weapon of mass destruction inside your own borders. I don't want to hide anything about what I do and all the cards are on the table. But then there's another level, which is, I am signing up to be your super soldier, and that's a whole different ballgame. I think that makes a lot of sense. I don't think they explicitly indicate whether both of those options are required by being part of the Sokovia Accords. I would hope not, but it's General Ross, so, right. you know, who, who he would never turn down a weapon that he, you know, could use. I just think that they, I think they underestimated how powerful and persuasive Ross's arguments were going to be in Civil War. We talk a lot about this in our story cast. So go check that out if you want to get a little bit more into that. But I think the idea of, A, acknowledging publicly, or at least to relevant government agencies, that you have the potential to do great harm, and that that is something that the public has a right to have some somebody getting some oversight on. And then separately, if you opt in, let's be generous for now, if you opt into battling bad guys with your abilities that if you're crossing borders, somebody else should have a say in that. I guess that's a concept I believe. Do you agree with that component? I do. Because like, if I go to Canada to fight, I feel like if I'm doing property damage to can- Canadian soil, and I just, I guess I feel like someone, some elected official from Canada should should have a say in that on behalf of their people, right? Right. And also, I think... Not every superhero is Iron Man or backed by a billionaire. True. And so we don't know this, but do the Sokovia Accords carry any protection against liability for superheroes? Because I would think that would be that would be another incentive to join. So you're saying like if I'm authorized by your government to come here, you can't sue me after the fact when I take down your Dunkin' Donuts franchise after hours. Exactly. Or somebody punches me through your Dunkin' Donuts because I was trying to save a gas refinery from being blown up. Right. Yeah. That would be a nice incentive. All right. So we have some basic ground rules of things that we would sign on to, assuming they were executed in good faith, which is the acknowledgement of of abilities separately, an opt-in ability such that if I'm going to fight international battles that in theory it would be good for the people whose sovereignty you would otherwise be violating, that there's an ability for somebody somewhere to opt into your support. Um, Obviously, we're about to interrogate some of those details, but but before we get to that, Jesse, how could the Sokovia Accords have survived the snap? And the reason I ask that is because it was pretty clear at the beginning of Endgame that very little a sort of popular culture had survived. Baseball was clearly dead. Sports were clearly no longer a thing. Captain America was such a non-superhero that he didn't even have 10 guys showing up to his support group. I have a tough time believing anybody was out there running around fighting crime in a superhuman fashion during that five years. Why or how did they even make it past that point? Well, I could see just pure inertia. They're just never repealed. Right. So... Who would bother? Right. You know, what are we regulating? There's no supervillains coming around. Thanos is gone. And especially given the events of Endgame where they hunt down and kill him a couple of weeks after the snap. So that threat's not out there. The Infinity Stones are gone. And ultimately what you have is this world where, okay, we would regulate superheroes if there were any need for them. But a lot of the dangerous ones are gone. And of the ones who are left, Look at what they're doing. They're hunting around the universe for various issues and threats that might pop up. But in terms of what's happening on Earth, it's pretty much like, yeah, they're just walking down the street trying to make their way through life like anyone else. Yeah, to your point, there's nobody to make a concerted effort to repeal them because that's the part that would take effort. That's a really good point that inertia favors the continued existence of the Accords. Black Widow is not going to go to the United Nations to the extent that that is even something that meets regularly 
after the snap, which is unclear. Right. And another thing to think about is what are those nations actually doing after the snap? They're not sitting here trying to figure out the particulars of regulating superheroes. They're trying to figure out how their economies work. They're trying to figure out how people get fed, um, right. how their entire infrastructure doesn't fall apart. Well, post blip, everybody's back. Society's experiencing a post blip boom at some point, you would assume. And we have Sokovia Accords and we have some superheroes running around. And I think Falcon and the Winter Soldier both qualify to your earlier categorization. So if there are Sokovia Accords, who is enforcing them? Well, that's an interesting thing that we never really get into about how the world is structured after this. <laughs> yeah. Do governments exist the way we thought they did? You know, I don't... What what year... So it was 2018 when Infinity War happened, right? Correct. You know, do you have midterm elections in the United States? Yeah. Do you... Yet yeah, how is power structured? How is the world functioning? And this gets to something I was thinking about in terms of the on-the-ground stuff. So I was thinking about the pandemic and the fact that, you know, we have this relief bill that's coming through and it has some one-time payments, but it also has some structural changes mm -hmm. that will outlast the pandemic. And I think from a personal political perspective in a good way, um, the child tax credit stuff, child Absolutely. care, et cetera. And you have to think post snap, a lot of the response is going to be, we need to take care of who's left. And I could see that being thing, anything from a universal basic income to nations merging to borders falling because you no longer are truly worried about, you know, maintaining that sovereignty in the same way. At this point, you're just trying to survive. Right. Because chances are, you know, you may live in a nation where everyone who knew how to store and maintain your nuclear weapons is gone. So you need somebody to come figure that out. Yeah, the person who, know, person who knows the code is gone. Yeah. But let's just for this experiment, I want to assume regular governance. Because I agree, you've, you've got some really great questions about the fundamental gears that turn society and how many of them are still spinning. But let's say they broadly bring back governments as we understand them. The thing mm -hmm. I still don't understand is who is meant to enforce the Sokovia Accords? We know Cap and Wanda are on the run at the start of Infinity War. From who? being chased by 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 what entity what agency is that a is that what sword is here to do is that what shields remnants were turned into some unnamed agency that's hunting these beings that could eviscerate them with one blast from a a hex hand right and that's part of how the mcu operates is that we seem to be able to get shadowy government agencies to pop up at the drop of a hat and my guess is that's what we'll find out that there is you know, we have sword, we have shield, we have, there's going to be something else. Spear. Ooh, cool. Uh, right. That is the entity that is, you know, enforcing the Sokovia Accords now. And it's going to be very interesting to find out how that actually operates in terms of that. Did, is there somebody who shows up at your house and gives you a ticket if you do unauthorized superheroing? I mean... Like, <laughs> Well, that's another question, though. But like, who who determines guilt or innocence? Because in civil war, it's just a matter of m minutes until these heroes presumably are apprehended and tossed in the raft. I don't know if that's pre-trial, and presumably there's some kind of adjudication that is due them and that will show up. But if not, it sure seemed like Thunderbolt Ross was the only one who got to decide whether this happened and who's responsible and what the outcome was right and civil war kind of implies it's a black box like you're outside of due process you're outside of international borders and is that the the punishment is that the sort of you know the way you keep people in compliance uh but then you have also spider-man homecoming where spider-man villains are just in regular jail pretty much true and so do they differentiate by power level do they differentiate by vi level of violation and in a world where you still do have this alien technology on the planet, like what is that? And that's why I asked that Hawkeye question. What's the barrier slash border between I've got some weird technology that ended up on our planet and I shot off an energy ray and I'm just a person who employs energy rays. It's, it's an interesting question to see what that, 
level is like do we differentiate technology versus innate ability right so you're saying the hawkeye question actually ties into the sokovia accord question because who counts as a superhero determines who even falls into sokovia accords because we do see scott lang is in prison even though he has absolutely no abilities absent the serum and ditto hawkeye hawkeye is in jail then i guess you're right like what are the what are the what are the articles of the sokovia accords that specify these things right and you think about the mcu on the ground shows uh you know your daredevil jessica jones um luke cage punisher those are all the shows that existed and do they exist anymore or i don't know if they exist uh and i just don't count iron fist that wasn't a show Yeah, let's all move past that but yeah do they count as superheroes i mean jessica jones and luke cage obviously had super strength and probably, you know, Captain America level super strength at the very least. Yeah. But do they count? Would those have affected them, even though they generally stay in their neighborhood? I would think so. Yeah. If, if it doesn't affect Jessica Jones, who used to be an actual costume superhero and can jump really high and is really strong and can take a bullet. I don't know who else. I don't know. It's got to be below that bar. Right. You know, Matt Murdock being able to see things with his eyes closed. That's maybe a bit more on the fence. But we're, again, we're talking about Hawkeye winding up on the raft. So clearly Matt right. Murdock would be over the line. Hawkeye had that affiliation. He was with, mm. you know, Vision and Scarlet Witch. and He could be jailed as an accomplice is what you're saying. Like maybe he's not actually a superhero. He's an, he's an, he's an accomplice. But yeah. And you think about like there are going to be people with undisputed superpowers, but they suck. Sure. Like. You're going to get the people who have weird energy manipulation abilities and all they can really do is make light turn different colors. Right. Increase static electricity to the point where all the hairs on your arms stand up or whatever. Right. And is that, are we seriously interested in regulating that as opposed to like the Punisher seems to be a far bigger threat and someone far more worthy of regulation slash being imprisoned Mm -hmm. than the person who can just, you know, make balloons inflate in their mind. So let's put your legal genius to work, Jesse. I'm putting you on the spot a little bit, but like roughly speaking, what is the language that should accurately capture everyone from the Punisher to Thor? How do we describe this meaningfully in a document like this, assuming we're again trying to actually make these work for people? Well, the issue is, do you differentiate by ability or by purpose? Yeah. Ability is going to sweep in a lot of people who may not necessarily have any affiliation with superheroing. And then you look at just regular human beings who are truly exceptional at what they do. And so is Serena Williams being the absolute best tennis player on earth, a superheroic ability. She can do things that very few people on earth can. Does that count? I did argue on StoryCast that White Men Can't Jump was basically a superhero movie. So maybe I do lean that way. I like mm-hmm. where you're going with the idea of purpose or intent, though. Right. And then you have the intent, which is how you get to a Hawkeye, where he is involved in superheroic fights. And so yeah. even if he doesn't necessarily have superpowers, he's aiding and abetting the use of those powers in ways that endanger the public or that could potentially endanger the public. Um And so that's how you potentially get to regulating the Punisher who doesn't have any, doesn't necessarily have any superpowers, but is involved in that world. Okay. And then there's also a whole lot of thorny issues with, you know, the taking the Punisher on his own. He's just a guy with a lot of guns and military training who is a murderer. That's, that's his thing, which (laughs) that's his thing. I kill people. Right. And his affiliation with superheroes is because they exist and they try to stop him slash interact with him slash they may share the same goals or be after the same person. And so, again, could you be a regular person drawn into the Sokovia Accords solely because of your affiliation with costumed people that you otherwise have no ability to interact with or even hang with in terms of what you can do? I feel like the purpose slash intent clause fixes a lot of the things that we've already been talking about. So if you never try to do any crime fighting, then the purpose or intent clause wouldn't apply. And it's arguable that if you never try to do any crime fighting outside of your own country's borders, 
which presumably already might account for superhero behavior or vigilante justice in general that these didn't don't apply to you. The nice thing about the purpose or intent clause is it says, hey, I don't care if you're Iron Man, Ant-Man, Thor, whatever. If you cross international boundaries with the intent to serve vigilante justice upon people, you fall under these accords. That seems like an all around good solution. Am I missing anything? I mean, I think that makes a lot of sense because it also gets into the regular person who just decides that they're going to slap together a costume and go hunt down bad guys. Right. Yeah. If somebody flies into Belgium and decides like anyone who shoplifts today, I'm just going to punch him in the face. Like, you know, I'd rather see them face some kind of accountability for that. Again, the Belgians probably have a plan for that. But if that person has wild electrical abilities or something, they may need some help. And that's where these documents come into play. Yeah. All right. I like all of that. I have one more Sokovia Accord question. And it's something they've never talked about in the movies, which I understand because the Accords have never really seemed to be actually enforced very much. People are just scared of them. What do you think the decision making process for deploying superheroes would be? In other words, a threat is happening. Ultron level threat. It's happening in a country. What happens? Is there any conceivable process that would not be horribly bloated, slow and ineffective? I don't think so. And that's the problem. You're always going to be playing behind the eight ball if that occurs. The other issue is how granular do the, do the accords get? Let's say that you're not fighting an Ultron level threat. You're fighting a paste pot Pete level threat. <laughs> do tell people the power level of pa- paste pot Pete for those who don't know. Uh, paste pot Pete is a, a Silver Age 60s era supervillain. Um, who was primarily in the Fantastic Four. (laughs) And his main powers were coming up with different kinds of glues that could stick people to things. Mm -hmm. And he mainly used these things to rob banks or, I guess, rob scientists who had other better kinds of glues so that he could get those glues and then have them for his own use. Uh, And usually the way that he was defeated was by the Fantastic Four showing up Reed Richards would say, oh, I know what these chemicals are. Here's, you know, a solution. A solvent, right? Right, right. Like, here's something I'll pour on this. Undo all of Paste Pot Pete's crimes. (laughs) Crud cutter. No! Right. Like, I just, like, he basically just had Gorilla Glue. Yeah, before anybody else. Yeah. Right. And he's had a gun that shot it out at people. So, you know, that's one of the weird things about the Sokovia Accords is that there's so many things to balance. And do you want to have to have an international tribunal set up that will determine whether or not you can stop this guy who's just like gluing people's hands to the wall for a few hours in downtown Manhattan? Here's the thing, though. I think it's so easy to shit on all forms of attempt good faith governance. It's very easy to say how hard it would be to do something. Here's what I think might work. And this is this. There's a comparison to this that's probably going to prove that I'm wrong. But I think every country would have to designate an official who can make an instant call. Essentially, they have a bat phone, right? The red phone they could pick up and say, there's an Ultron and I need help. In other words, I think we go, we move away from the model where the Avengers are flying around trying to decide whose country they go in. I think the Avengers might also be able to pick up the bat phone and say, hey, Ulysses Claw is in your country. Can we come get him? And they could say yes. But I think you need a person and maybe you need two people so that there's like a 12 hour on off thing and nobody ever misses and you've got to have backups for those people. But the point is 24 seven, there's one person with decision making authority that reports directly to the leader of that country who is able to yes or no that instantly and or make that call. What do you think? I like that. Uh, The problem is we just see the various issues we've had with Hydra slash Shield, with Tyler Hayward, right, et cetera. One where, corrupt person can make the call to the Avengers and have them wipe out supposedly a band of you know armed terrorists who are really just opposition leaders of you know an opposing party or something. Yeah, or withhold them back from saving people uh, because they're a part of whatever schemes going on. Or they're just being blackmailed or their families being held hostage. I mean, exactly. Oh, you're right. My fucking model doesn't work. Yeah. And then the problem is they like, you might want to try an AI, but we've seen what happens in Marvel when you have AIs. No, it's nuts. The last on the list. Oh shit. So it really wouldn't work. Cause what yeah. I was, that's a much more, 
devastating look at the plan. I was like, well, the problem is it turns into instant replay in sports where you think, well, we'll just have somebody go over and look at a monitor. And then they get tied up in knots about the decision and wh whether the foot's in bounds or out of bounds. And I could easily see these kinds of officials being all consternation and frustration as they try to decide what to do. And there's political pressures in the country about whether or not to invite these superheroes in and what are the con consequences going to be. And if they do answer to the leader of the country, all of that information comes into play. So that's what I was worried about. But shit, you're right. They could just easily be corrupted or exploited. Damn it. Right. So there's no real good way to do this, is there? The, the way that I think about it is... If you think about the Avengers slash superhero subject to the Accords as part of a military force, then they're effectively always in ready position. They're always ready to go. And what you end up doing is setting rules of conflict and engagement that they have to abide by or else after the fact, they'll be stripped of the ability to operate. That's the only real way I could think of it to work is that you had have to give them the autonomous ability to do it subject to the accords. And then they would be sanctioned after the fact if they violated whatever the rules of engagement were. That then turns into the whole issue of, you know, if effectively superheroes have a version of the Geneva Convention, does that work in a world where there's pressure one way or the other for superheroes to go past those limits, you know? It's, it's, it was necessary. It was necessary for me to kill this person. It was necessary for me to put these people at risk because the benefits outweighed the harms. And if there's political pressure one way or the other, you could see those really being contorted. But that's also the issue we would have with the Geneva Conventions with standards of international war that are currently ongoing. That sounds like the least bad option to me. That also doesn't sound like what General Ross was telling us those accords were, which is unfortunate, but not surprising right. given his abilities. Do you think they will come up in Falcon and the Winter Soldier as a plot point or a device? I think so. Um, and do we know yet whether Falcon and Winter Soldier occurs after WandaVision or before or during or? I haven't seen any confirmation of that either way. I would guess after only because WandaVision is so close to the blip, but I don't know. It's a good question. Yeah, because I could see them coming up just from the perspective of if this is a thing that we're going to be treating as having existed. Yeah, like, hey, you remember your old teammate? She just enslaved a town because she was sad. And why didn't Mysterio get caught up in the Sokovia Accords? I know he was technically working with Nick Fury, but Nick Fury's off the grid. Right. I'm not entirely sure. And that, again, it might just be that the Sokovia Accords don't really exist, weren't really enforced. Right. Because the amount of time that the Sokovia Accords were actually in effect compared to the snap is short. Yes. Yeah. And so I could also see like it was a it was a short lived attempt at regulating superheroes. It didn't work. And so even if they are on the books, yeah, let's just let them be and we'll figure it out as we go along. On that note, let's let those Sokovia Accords be, Jesse, and talk a little bit about the making of these shows. Let's go meta. You have any questions about the movie making, story making, filmmaking process around Falcon and the Winter Soldier as it gets closer? So the thing I was thinking about, if we think about Black Panther, the way that he was introduced to the MCU is through the Winter Soldier. Okay. And it was through that Winter Soldier that we got this sort of unapologetically black Afrofuturistic narrative that we were introduced to as an audience and then got spun off into what I would say is probably the best MCU movie. Mm -hmm. And everything I've read about Falcon and Winter Soldier so far, it's a focus on Falcon and it's also an unapologetically black story. And mm -hmm. it probably won't be Afrofuturistic in the same way Black Panther was, but still a story about Sam Wilson, about his life, about him. And so my question is, is Winter Soldier slash Sebastian Stan the best ally for black superheroes in the MCU? And I don't mean that in the best way. It's like, is there a better one? I mean, just from a sense of getting the stories in, is there anyone, who a character or an actor who has done a better job of introducing audiences and getting them to understand black superheroes and embrace them right? and embrace them than the winter soldier and Sebastian Stan, who's also, may I point out, never had a problem with second billing. There will never be a winter soldier movie. There's never going to be a full on winter soldier show. He's second build in this. He was a supporting character in the black Panther arc. 
and he's just done a great job with it. It's funny because Christine's number one quality that she identified as the strength of Bucky is that he's willing to share the spotlight. He is not a selfish person. He is perfectly happy to be your backup, your wingman, your support, and he has no problem getting out of the way, which is something he learned by watching Steve Rogers go from zero to hero. And she specifically referenced that scene in First Avenger when Peggy blows right past Bucky to get with Steve as kind of the aha moment for him when he becomes that willing wingman. And so I do think there's something to Bucky as a character who is inherently kind of born of a sidekick, right? That's where he came from in the comics. Sebastian Stan seems to have really embraced that. Hell, as an actor, I mean, I, Tanya is another tour de force performance by him in a supporting role. His performance shines a light that makes Margot Robbie's burn even brighter. She she he is willing to reflect that light back at her. I don't know. I think there is something to him as an actor in that sort of number two role where it's always magic. Yeah. And I think that's one of the strengths that Marvel folks have had that Disney's had is finding those people who fit in those ro- roles well. And it it's a hard road to toe because Every Marvel movie is like 15 different super charismatic people colliding into one another. Right. And it's been the problem that I have with the Ant-Man movies. I like them, but there are too many good comedic actors who just get lost in the shuffle. Interesting. Like if you think about Ant-Man, his ex-wife and her new husband, Judy Greer and Bobby Cannavale, I could watch either of them in anything for like four hours. And they're just side characters. They come in for a couple of scenes, they play comic relief and they head off. And every time I've seen them in movies, I wanna see more of them. Whereas with Winter Soldier, probably cause he's a superhero, let's be honest. But I feel like you get enough of him, you like him, and he serves his role in the plot without you wishing that he were the one in the lead. They've written him and Sebastian Stan performs him in such a way that I'm okay that I'm seeing Steve Rogers as the lead and him as the secondary character who has a relationship. Um, And I feel like it'll be the same way in Falcon and Winter Soldier. It's just a really kind of remarkable thing they've done with a guy who's a good actor and who, you know, has sort of played this pivotal role all along. I want to be clear. Your problem with Ant-Man is there's too many great actors in the movie. It's that... There's too many people I want to see do more, which that sounds like the same thing to me. It is the same thing, but it's the same. It's the same way you see a movie, you see a good movie and there's that character in it who gets five minutes and you're like, I want to see that person again. Like they're, you know, the star making turn or the great supporting actor and you want to see them some more. And your issue isn't that the movie's bad. It's that you just wish that you could see that person you liked do that thing you liked even more than they do. Yeah, I guess I see that. To me, I think there are three Marvel movies very close together in a tier, Black Panther, Spider-Man, and Ant-Man. So I am very pro Ant-Man. I think it's on the like super elite tier. So, but anyway, I just, I think Ant-Man is really good. So I don't know. I just want to push back a little on well, that's Well, it's not me saying Ant-Man is bad. No, I it's, get it. I'm just... Yeah. I just like, I like seeing Judy Greer. I'd rather see her for five minutes than zero minutes. Although I do agree with your point from previous episode where you said we missed out on an opportunity to have her be like a full on supervillain. Right. And it's not the, it's not the Hawkeye's family problem where Linda (laughs) Cardellini shows up at his, as his wife and her job is just to be happy and wear flannel shirts. Right. Poor Linda Cardellini. Uh. Well, this is a great question. And so I, what I was curious about was your perspective on diversity in the Marvel Cinematic Universe production leadership, right? So Malcolm Spellman is running this show. He is a black man. He has talked about this being an unapologetically black superhero story. Are we making progress or is this quote unquote progress because Kevin Feige is still sitting at the top making all these key decisions about who, what, when, where, and how? I think we are making progress if only because what we've seen in especially Black Panther to a certain degree, Captain Marvel is we're at least getting these stories where these alternative perspectives are fronted Mm -hmm. and not simply shoehorned into what we already have. 
we aren't getting stories with a black Iron Man or a right. Latino Thor or something like that. We're getting individual characters with individual backstories. It's taken way too long. Mm-hmm. And it means that we've had, you know, assuming we start the official beginning of the MCU about 2008, it means that for about a decade, we had a lot of actors of various backgrounds, various cultures, um, who did not get that opportunity to shine in those roles because the casting was still very much, you know, we need a white man in the front, uh, a white male protagonist, and a love interest. Mm -hmm. And so I think they're correcting that now, and we're going to be getting a lot more interesting stories. And the thing that I like is that we're not seeing them bow to sort of that terrible internet pressure that you saw, I think specifically with Kelly Marie Tran in Star Wars, mm-hmm. and you've seen it in other perspectives, where you know you have a very vocal but very minor portion of the fan base who thinks that unless the story is white men doing the thing that they want to see them do, it's a story about Mary Sue's, or it's a story that's only bowing to diversity and it's not telling a real story. So I think it's a good start, but I'm interested to see where it goes. And what I hope we don't see happen is we have two tracks of story right. where we have, you know, like your Doctor Strange, Multiverse of Madness, continuing on the Avenger storyline level stories, and then these little one-offs or alternate tracks that don't really go along with, quote unquote, the main thrust of the MCU. I think you're right. That would be a huge problem. And there's some signs for hope, right? We know Monica Rambeau is very likely to play a prominent role in the new Captain Marvel, which is directed by Nia DaCosta. It's an excellent sign. One of the things that struck me about both Malcolm Spellman and Carrie Scoglin, the Canadian woman who directs all of the episodes of Falcon and the Winter Soldier, is that both of them have been in the past very outspoken about glass ceilings and limitations and obstacles In other words, they're not playing the good soldier. Does that matter at all that Marvel is willing to hire creators who are out there speaking about the limitations of the industry? I think so, because you could see Marvel slash Disney, the way that these movies have succeeded, going in one of two directions. The first, and I think the worst route, would be for them to say, we've got an incredibly valuable franchise that has worked a certain way. So we're not going to challenge that. We're not going to push that. And what we're going to end up getting are effectively the same movies with the same beats over and over again. Mm -hmm. I think as we saw in WandaVision, even with the structure of Infinity War and Endgame, we saw that we're not getting that. We're getting something different. And that's the second route that they could go. And I think the better route, which is to say, you could literally put out anything with a Marvel name on it. And once you know, we're all vaccinated back in movie theaters or however distribution is going to happen in the future. That movie is going to make half a billion dollars. Mm -hmm. Like as with the promotion, with the machine that they have going and to say, let's take risks with it because you can't continue this. This is something that Marvel and Disney want to continue for 10, 20, 30 years down the line. Maybe more than that. Yeah. Like in their optimal world, the sort of Star Wars original movie through Rise of Skywalker is the floor of how long this should last. But with more movies, with more content, with more things being put out. And at a certain point, you have to change and you have to innovate or else what you're going to get are those spikes of nostalgia that come back, but nothing that lasts, nothing that people appreciate, nothing that people are going to want to come back for. And we even see it with The Mandalorian versus Rise of Skywalker. If you ask anyone who's interested in Star Wars what it is that they've enjoyed the most in the past five years, chances are it's going to be Mandalorian or The Last Jedi or something along those lines. It's not going to be The Rise of Skywalker, which was the most sort of on beat, hit every standard Star Wars note product that they've put out in a long time. And it just wasn't good. And it's, no. I don't think anybody would call that beloved. <laughs> yeah. The people who would certainly aren't in our audience and God help us if they're in anybody's audience. So I do think Marvel's progress has been marked by the word incremental, right? They've made baby steps along the way and we're starting to see that pay off in substantive ways, I hope. 
What's a big step they could take that would push this forward more substantively? Or is there such a thing, given all of the inertia of the sort of general whiteness of the MCU project? I think one of the big things they could do is to take a project with sort of your a, a stock level hero slash villain slash story. And I don't have anybody who's necessarily coming to mind, but I'm thinking, you know, a C tier Avenger, um, a lesser known Spider-Man villain, something like that, and give them a story that explores things that have never been fronted in the MCU before. And by that, I mean, you know, gender identity, Mm -hmm. race, religion. And I think they'll get into that with Miss Marvel uh, because her faith is so inextricably tied to her character and who she is that it's impossible to separate the two. And there will be stories that push that, but to effectively say, look, we're going to tell the same general kind of stories that you're looking for. You're going to have the touches of humor. You'll have action, et cetera. But let's also focus on other aspects of identity that will matter to our audience and also use that, I guess, cachet that the MCU has to effectively say, you can take this or leave it, but a lot more people are going to take it than are going to leave it. Mm -hmm. But then you also get into the fact that it's a global phenomenon, not just an American one. And so, you know, whenever you talk about movies, big screen, high budget movies, you're talking about what sells in other countries. And are there going to be, they're, they're going to cut back on elements of identity and narrative in order to make those things as palatable as possible to as many markets as possible. I don't think to get to one of your, to one of the questions you asked that the MCU any longer has to be centered in whiteness. And the reason for that is that if you look at the core heroes of, and I'll call it the infinity war phase, the infinity stone phase, captain America by nature of his story has to be white pretty much. There's no way that you could have the face of the U.S. military, the person they put in costume to send out to um, sell the entire war project as a non-white person and a non-white, non-male person in the 1940s, which is how you get to Sam Wilson now having the shield and maybe assuming that identity we don't know. Thor is the Norse god of thunder. It's hard to explain how we all came to understand who Thor was, especially in relation to North North mythology. You didn't take that class in high school? Right. Uh, And also, I mean, Tony Tony Stark is a billionaire. Uh, It's very hard to imagine an American billionaire in this day and age who's not a white man for a variety of social reasons. But the nice thing is that as we get further and further away from having the mcu have to be the real world there's nothing like the blip that has ever happened in the real world or could ever happen in the real world we hope you can get away from those constraints of identity that would force you to keep those heroes white and male and in their original identity and that's why i think we've talked about this before i don't remember if it's on the pod or just offline but with the fantastic four The only hero that needs to maintain any aspect of their original identity is the thing because he's Jewish. (laughs) And for him, that is an integral part of his character. And it's a part of his character that leads to some really interesting stories. Keep that. But Reed Richards doesn't need to be a 40 something white man. Sue Storm doesn't need to be a blonde white lady, which again, that was one of the things I disliked most about the original fantastic four is just like, we're going to try to make Jessica Alba who at the time was like one of the most famous people in the world and who was also, you know, incredibly beautiful. And we're just going to try to make her into a blonde white lady for no apparent reason. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I love your optimism here. I'm a little worried that they are not going to have the guts to push the fantastic four in this way. And also, when it's time to bring the X-Men in, which is why I was curious about whether we're ever going to escape the MCU being inextricably tied to these comics written in the 60s, almost all exclusively white characters. But I hope so, because everything you just said about the Fantastic Four is 100% right. There's nothing about Reed Richards that indicates any race whatsoever, or at least the qualities of him that you're going to keep. 
And they're not afraid to change all kinds of things about all kinds of characters. And I don't know a single time when that's hurt the story. I am sure there are incels out there that are mad about something somewhere, but that doesn't matter and you can't run from that. So I hope you're right. And I do think you're right about something like the blip being such a great opportunity to imagine a world that the world we want to be to be a few steps ahead in the MCU than it is right now in our world. Right. You're giving me hope, Jesse. I'm, I'm trying I'm, to I'm normally the one every week who says the word genocide 15 times. So I'm trying to be more positive this week. No, look, uh, on that note of hopefulness, let's talk about life in the MCU where I have some <laughs> maybe <laughs> less helpful questions. I want to return to the weirdness a little bit. So the thing I have been noodling on is cryptocurrency because the whole NFT thing. And if you don't know what that is, first of all, congratulations, I'm jealous. It's basically the ability to sell the idea of a single token that represents something like a GIF or an NBA highlight or whatever it is as a digital entity that only you technically own, even though the whole internet can access the exact same thing at any time, whatever. But cryptocurrency, I, I grasp as essentially a store of value because people say it's a store of value and truthfully, that's not very different from money. And even if you think it's different from money, it's really not different than art or collectibles. My copy of Avengers number eight, which is my most prized comic in the world, Kang's first appearance, who will show up in Ant-Man's Quantum Mania, is only valuable because people say it is. I have a digital copy in my Marvel Unlimited subscription that is available to me on demand. And the one that I have that is in a little case is only valuable because other people say it is. And so cryptocurrency, I get it. My, my question for you, Jesse, is in a world where supervillains need to transact business, would cryptocurrency be incredibly, insanely valuable? Because I'm thinking about whoever they are going against in Falcon and the Winter Soldier is probably going to have spent a lot of money on their project. And I'm betting they did it in Bitcoin. That's a really good question. Because you also think about the fact that the level of super genius ing, I don't know the verb for that. <laughs> yeah, I think that's it. I think you yeah, just made the it up. Super genius ing in the MCU. You have to think that your standard cryptocurrency, your your Bitcoin, your dogcoin, your NFTs, they're valuable because the protection on them is such that it would take a tremendous amount of energy to break them down, to copy it, to decode what it is someone else has. Mm -hmm. So the security comes in the complexity. But you're also in a world where, you know, Jarvis got turned into Ultron. Ooh, that's a good point. And there's probably, you know, depending on how expansive they get with the MCU, there's probably, you know, what? I'd say f at least 15, 20 people easy who could understand what happened and recreate it and perhaps even improve on it. And so when you're talking about supervillains, it, is their cryptocurrency even more crypto? Like, do you think Dr. Doom would create his own token? That would actually be amazing because... Oh, my God. It, it gets back to the old, like the old timey villainy of, you know, I created Doom Bucks. Or I created Luther Dollars. <laughs> Except it's cryptocurrency and it's backed by like one of the five smartest people in the world. Nobody's ever going to break this. You're right. And chances are they could somehow make cryptocurrency that would be as complex, but either based on renewable energy or would use so much less energy than actual cryptocurrency does now. Yeah, that's incredible. So you're saying not only would supervillains use cryptocurrency, they would improve cryptocurrency. Yes. That's terrifying. I assume it would just be illegal then in their world at a certain point because how could you control any of this? But... You think about somebody like Dr. Doom, who's a sovereign. Oh, right. So he's not creating cryptocurrency. This isn't some person creating cryptocurrency sitting in their office. He's a sovereign of a nation and can say, this is the official currency or an official currency of our nation. To not honor it would be to violate any number of international accords. So what if Latveria makes its money by being the cryptocurrency hub of the world in a place where they're trying their best to control it, but he's comfortable with the idea of this anonymous transaction, all based on the financial system he's created with his super brain. Holy crap. Right. And presume that he has created a way that he and he alone could track all of those exchanges of currency 
without anyone else being the wiser. Like the only person. Well, that would be the reason not to trust Doom Bucks. Yes, because you know Doctor Doom is going to find a way to blackmail you with whatever. If you're using that to run your drug empire, and all of a sudden Doctor Doom's like, "Hey, I'd like a piece of that, and if you don't give it to me, I'll turn over the transactions." I feel like that would be a concern of. uh, a Loki dollar or whatever. Right. You know? Or you just, you run it through a shadow organization or you, you run it as if it is Bitcoin, but it's actually, you know, let Viria money. I mean, to that point then, is it possible that cryptocurrency in our world will give birth to actual super villainy? Because once you can create the anonymous scale of transactions that Bitcoin now is worth 60,000, basically as of today or yesterday, I think, per coin, once you're transacting at that level, you can move a lot of units of very expensive and rare things. Is it possible somebody's going to do something really terrible with all of that? I mean, it's hard not to think that because <laughs> to have a currency that is in some ways untraceable can be moved incredibly easily. I mean, we know that the ultimate outcome of probably 80% of action movies is somebody waiting for someone else to hit the button to start the electronic transfer of money so that they can get away with their scheme yeah ultron with his you know whole billion dollars transacted in a second with ulysses claw right shit that's terrifying well that was the main thing i was just wanting to noodle on about life in the mcu what do you have for me post blip post wand vision everything we know about the mcu now if you had superpowers, would you reveal yourself as a superhero in the MCU? And let's say your superpowers are, let's say a standard mix of powers. Like let's say you have super strength and can fly, or you've got some sort of energy manipulation and you're fast or something like mm-hmm. that. Like not Captain Marvel, Thor level powers, but just standard. Everyone can see them. You're very clearly super powered kind of powers. I have a tough time imagining that I wouldn't use those to earn a living. It's the one thing I don't really ever buy about the Jessica Jones story at some level is that, I mean, she kind of does use them to make a living, I suppose, in that, but she's also seen a lot more shit than I ever have. And so maybe it's just as a product of that. But if I was granted superpowers at this point, I have a tough time believing that whether it was just performing feats of daring do for audiences at the equivalent of air shows or whether I was hired as security for somebody or took on the role of some kind of organized vigilante system or, you know, I don't think I'd sign up to be part of the U.S. government based on what we've seen in our lifetimes. But I feel like I would reveal myself because I have a tough time imagining that I would continue a humble existence in the Peter Parker vein. Does that make any sense? It does. Especially in a world where people are primed to be interested in superpowers. And I mean, even if you even if your life's dream is to be something that isn't necessarily or inherently superpowered, you could still use it to promote yourself, to make more money. You could be the author who can walk through walls. You could be the zookeeper that could lift the elephant. I mean, I'd be interested in in things that help people manage their day to day life and experiences with superpowers. It'd, Not to be like a superhero therapist, I don't have any qualifications for that, but just to be like uh, a support group leader. We were talking on CharacterCast about how Sam Wilson's work with his PTSD groups is one of our favorite things about him. I feel like it would be really helpful to have people talking about the things that are hard about living with superpowers and only people with superpowers could do that. And it'd be pretty interesting to be able to take that on. I just also have just enough of an ego that I could not sit on that shit. And I'm fine with being that shallow. I'm fine with it. I've made my peace with it. You know Samson in in Marvel Comics, right? We'll tell people about Dr. Samson. So Dr. Samson is a gamma-powered therapist. He sure is. He has super strength, but it's below Hulk and She-Hulk. He's... Kind of, I think, a little bit more powerful than a Spider-Man, but not quite as powerful as a She-Hulk or a Hulk. Um, And many times throughout the history of Marvel Comics, he's been used in issues and in arcs where they need to get into someone's psyche, uh, where he needs to sit down with them or where they need to understand why someone is behaving in a particular way. And he would be a golden character in the MCU as long as you could get somebody who could come through on both ends of you know both being like a hulking man with long green hair who could also come off as a credible therapist would you reveal your abilities if you had them yeah 
one, because they would just be very difficult to hide, I think. Right. And also because I'm the kind of person who I'm tall. And so I just structure my life in a lot of ways around being tall. Mm -hmm. Like I put the things I, whenever I hang a picture in my house, it's always at my eye level. It's just how you think. It's how you behave. It's a part of who you are. And so I could see, you know, if you could lift a truck, a lot of things in your life are going to be structured around the fact that you can lift a truck uh, from the way you just position stuff in your house to how you go about your day. You know, if I could fly at the speed of sound, I wouldn't commute to work. I'd just fly there. Right. If I could. Um, so there's just so many things about having superpowers. If a superpower would make your day somehow easier or more convenient, make your job more fun to do or easier to do, even in just that day-to-day -day aspect, even if you're not superheroing or doing anything spectacular with it, I could still see the fact that, you know, it's just, it's going to be a part of who you are and you're either going to have to let it out or go through a whole series of contortions so that nobody ever finds out that you have these powers. I also think it's been a strength of the MCU that they have not overly relied on secret identities. It was always a struggle for me to grasp that, even as a kid reading comic books, as to why you would hide that ability. Not that there haven't been very good justifiable reasons for a variety of characters over a number of kinds of stories. I just think at the end of the day, I am Iron Man at the end of the first movie is very much how I would behave in that circumstance. Yeah. And I never understood Captain America having a secret identity. Yeah. It was a big thing in the comics for a long time. But he was the reincarnated version of a superhero from the 40s. And I think people knew he was the same guy. <laughs> and at a certain point, it's like, what is, what is the purpose of your secret identity? I think the idea was always that you wouldn't have people attacking you at your home. Sure. But the MCU also has the setup of there aren't supervillains everywhere. Right. There aren't, you know, 500 different people coming for Captain America's head at all times. They have their own goals, their own motivations. And I think it's also a more believable version of supervillainy. Because at the end of the day, do you care as much about killing Captain America as you do about, you know, robbing a bank mm -hmm. or stealing $5 million worth of Bitcoin or whatever it is you want to do? But it's the same issue that I've always had with the Purge movies, where if I could commit any crime I wanted for one night, it wouldn't be to kill somebody. It would be to get as much money as I could and enjoy the hell out of my life for the next year. Basically, just get something, go wild, blow it all in the next 364 days so that nobody can seal it from me at the next purge. I love how much you think about that. It cracks me up every time. Yeah. And you're 100% right, to be clear. This is not me arguing. I just think it's amazing that that's always front of mind for you is in the purge. <laughs> I will commit financial crimes and that yes. will be my calling card. I love it, Jesse. It's always so fun to talk about this and I cannot wait for us to have a new show to chew on. Where, as people get excited about Falcon and the Winter Soldier, can they find you if they want to talk to you? They can find me on Twitter at Jesse L. Taylor, all one word. Well, legendary listeners, that is our show for today. Marvelous TV Club We'll be back on Saturday with a thematic breakdown of that first episode of Falcon and the Winter Soldier, courtesy of Maeve and Amanda. Then Christine and I will take stock of the winners and losers of that episode on Monday. And finally, Jesse and I will be back on Wednesday with the most considered of takes on the wildest questions posed by this first episode. Okay, General Ross, you can take your thugs and get the hell out of here. <laughs>